Hey gamers, your buddy Work. I recorded this wrap up previously and I just didn't like it and it got cut short. So instead of trying to edit things together, I'm just recording it again a little later. I actually have a little bit of a little outline here. So if you see me looking down, that's what that's what I'm doing. Is I want to make sure that I include everything. A uh, surprising amount of things happened and when I was trying to tell the story, I kept getting them out of order and that was very annoying. So try this again. Um, trying to do less of the ums. As what this channel is, is wrap up for my Sunday monthly campaign of Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Right now we're running Turn of Fortune's Wheel. I'm located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm the DM. I have five players. For this specific session, I had Connor, uh, Jesse, and Dylan, and then I had Jake, who left early, and I had Gabe, who came late. So there was a little bit of like a uh, energy change halfway through or, or two-thirds of the way through when we kind of traded out players, but... For the whole time, we had four, and briefly, we had five. So pretty good, pretty good numbers. That's kind of what I'm looking for, is four or five people, ideally. At the end of the last session, uh, the party had made it to Fortune's Wheel. So they went through the Undersigil, and they came out uh, after uh, destroying some of the Vargoyles and Cakers, and getting a little uh, wacky flavor. Uh, Sigil and uh, the the I don't know what you call it defunct factions that have been driven into the shadows here. So they make it to the casino. They they actually get snuck into the casino um, by the Shadowcar um, spy that was 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 hustling them through secretly to the anonymous benefactor. So once they arrived at the casino, which is Fortune's Wheel. Um, they snuck in and they met uh, Valak. Uh, I called him the concierge, and I printed out a thing so you can see. You know, I wanted uh, the colorful, formal dress. Like this is what Valak looks like, and I threw that out on the table. And that way, it's, it's a little easier for them to remember. Again, I use visual aids like this all the time, um, and I have several of them here. Just kind of sharing them with you. Just kind of. I noticed a lot of the time I don't do that, so I thought it'd be nice. Uh, and again, AI art, man. Um, a lot of AI art, uh, I'm not generating it. It's just already out there on the internet. So I do keyword searches and turn it up and pretty much dig. And eventually I find it. Sorry, I'm drinking a little coffee. So once they're in a casino and they meet Valak, uh, the guide takes off, right? The spy says, unless you guys need me for anything else, of course they say no. Boom, he's gone. So now they're, they're completely... Uh, Beholden to Valak at this point, you know, uh, they're amnesiacs, um, they're, they're just going along with it, they don't know what's going on at all. So Valak um, gives them all their own rooms, they don't have to share rooms. Um, he, he gives them food and drink and allows them to clean up. Uh, I kind of hand waved that they were able to level at this point. Um, they didn't take a long rest. But it was early evening when they got there, so it made more sense to them that they <clears throat> they didn't want a long rest and then have to wait another 12 hours before like the nightlife kicked off at the casino. So I just gave them another short rest, called it a long rest, and, and progressed the story from there because just the timelines lined up better. So <clears throat> while, ever, excuse me, while everyone was doing that, the Minotaur... So uh, Dylan's um, rune, rune Knight Fighter Minotaur, uh, he just basically waited. Uh, he just waited for everybody else to get ready. And once they came down, um, Valak had given them all 20 Razor Leafs. So the casino works on chips that are called Razor Leafs, right? Like Razor Vine in the cage. So uh, they're, they're, you know, casino tokens, casino chips. Uh, with razor leafs on them and they trade out i think it's 10 gold to a razor leaf maybe 20 gold i forget but <clears throat> i didn't want the party to feel like they were going to lose any of their own money i just gave them some money to play with um so like i comped them i guess 
uh, 20 razor leafs. So they were able to gamble and, and, and try some of the, the games without really being concerned about losing their wealth. Um, and they all wanted to get a turn on Fortune's Wheel. Uh, while they were checking out that bar at the entrance there, um, I explained, you know, they had the historical Fortune's Wheel, the original Fortune's Wheel set up like a, you know, like a uh, museum piece uh, in a glass, in a glass display. And I also explained, <clears throat> you know, the front door uh, had an Oni bouncer. I wanted to, um, you know, describe the Oni uh, they can look a lot of different ways, but basically described him as a samurai looking guy. Uh, you know, he has a, like a bastard sword. He has, um, he has a look like he's in charge. Like you don't want to pull anything with him. Uh, they saw him bringing people in and turning people away. They also saw Mesoloth bouncers. Um, again, I wanted to go ahead and give them, uh, just so they could in mentally image what a uh, Mesoloth is. Uh, everybody has a lot of different ideas. I'm like, hey, this is what they look like. So they don't, you know, it's just quick. Again, it's thrown out on the table. Um, you know, I explain to them that they're no nonsense. Like, these guys are guards. They are good at their job. Like, they're just, they're all kind of all over the place. There's two here at the front door, and there's several th the, throughout the, the establishment. But I thought that was a great, you know, you can see the the trident, the man catcher type uh, thing that they use, and you know, you describe like a beetle life, fe beetle like fiend. You get a lot of different mental images. I really like that guy. So, uh, you know, explain that they were there. Uh, they also saw someone go through uh, to the platinum room. Uh, so from they were hanging out in the bar. They were watching. Uh, the, there was a spectral um, magician. It's like a ghost magician, and they were watching that. And I described it, and that the, there were gnolls there that were heckling him, and <clears throat> they kind of sat down and and uh, kind of um, rooted for the guy. Like they made a lot of you know they they were wow yay and that's amazing right they all supported him, uh, just in defiance of the gnolls, like they were trying to, uh, they were trying to counter balance the, the gnolls and their jeering. And, um, and, and when, when they were done, when the magician was done, they tried to jump up on stage and, and perform and no one in the party is a performer, but they tried to jump up on the stage and as soon as they did, like the Mesolos were like, no, you don't do that here. And they were like, oh, so it's kind of, that was a DM decision. I kind of wish that I would have let them do something funny and then we could have done some stuff. And like, you could tell like the players were ready to cause some trouble and all of that. But that's, this is a highbrow establishment. I didn't think that was appropriate here. Plus things can get out of, tro out of control pretty quickly in this sort of environment and I think just the professionalism of the of the bouncer and the guards they just were not they were not having it so I felt a little bad about that but like it just seemed it, it seemed true like I I, um, I kind of wish that I could have gone with it if it were if they did the same thing at the smoldering corpse or somewhere like that then I would have been all about it like I would have, but but we're actually here at fortune's wheel I wasn't into it so everybody was excited to give a roll give a turn on fortune's wheel uh, they went down they gave her a spin everybody busted out I don't think anybody got um, one guy got a tentacle like a, uh, a mind flayer tentacle and they're like, the fuck do we do with this? And they're like, y you want it. Uh, okay. And then like a couple guys uh, busted out. And then another one rolled and got like two tentacles. And they were like, wah, like this sucks. So then the Minotaur wanted to roll again. I said, no. You only get one roll every 24, you know, one turn every 24 hours. And they were like, what the fuck, man? This place sucks. I was like, them's the rules. You know, you got, you're getting free rolls anyway. Like, what do you care? Blah, blah, blah. 
So they they went and they played some slots. The Minotaur found some ice giants and got into a drinking competition at the ice bar. And, you know, I described the ice bar with the dragon drowning in sorrows. And I, I described the, the Yeti bartender there, uh, Fiwi. And I had a picture of him. Uh, you know, that's that's what the Yetis look like here. Like, he's all blown out. And he's the great hair. And he's real kind of goofy. You know, I... 20 years ago, I had... Uh, when we were playing against the Giants, there's a Frost Giant portion of that campaign. And there were some Yetis in, like, the Glacial Rift. And... The party massacred the Yetis, and there was, like, the Yeti leader, like, the Yeti chieftain or whatever, and they saved him, and, it, like, there was a voice associated with that, so now that's my Yeti voice, because everybody just, it was hilarious the way that, the way that that went down, and he became, like, a companion for the party through the rest of that adventure. Uh, hey, guys, it's okay. You know, so it was kind of like that, uh, you know, welcome to the ice bar. And, uh, yeah, Fiwi. So, that they had fun with Fiwi. Uh, there was a drinking competition. We basically gave him con saves. Um, they, he, he lost eventually, but I would, we would do a roll, and then I would go through the other players, and then I would come back, and we'd do another roll, and he'd fail, so I'm like, okay, your next roll is going to be with disadvantage, and then we'd go through the other players and what they were doing, and we'd come back to the drinking competition, so it was, there was a little bit of suspense, and it was kind of fun, you know, um, while we were doing that, Connor talked to the ice dragon, Found out that the ice dragon was bust and that he needed some money. And he was like, good luck with that. And took off. So <laughs> I was like, okay, I know what's happening here in a couple of hours. Um, they played some slots. They played um, uh, the other the other games, which is really just high-low and, and whatnot. Um... So then the Vecna impersonators come out. So the Vecna impersonators, everybody's like, uh, the people that had played in my previous campaign didn't really know who Vecna was. Um, none of these characters know who Vecna is, but a couple of the players have heard of Vecna. And uh, again, this was the, the thing that kind of bothered me was they didn't really give you... I wish that there were can lines that these guys would say i don't know much about vecna i didn't read any of the previous campaigns like i'm considering doing a eve of ruin after this but i haven't read it yet so i mean it's a celebrity that i know nothing about and now they're impersonators like it would be like you know an elvis impersonator if you've never heard or seen elvis so that's basically where i am with that they didn't really give you like they just said, hey, this is what they're like. But they don't give you, like, scripts or, or phrases or any. I don't know. I felt put in a weird position um, by the module. But they were pickpocketing people. They pickpocketed Connor. Um, Connor didn't see them, but another party member saw them pickpocket Connor. Connor's character. I forget his name. And... They confronted the Vecna impersonators. They got their money back. They saw that they had pickpocketed a lot of people uh, in the casino. You know, the Mesoloths and uh, Valak whisked them away. And the party made a big stink, or Connor made a big stink. You know, I can't believe this is the kind of place that you run, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, you know, you lost your free chips. Like, why are you so upset, you know? And he's like, well, you know, I, I've been violated, and these are your staff that are, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to tell everybody. And they were like, okay, how about this? We'll give you another spin on uh, Fortune's Wheel. We'll give you another spin on Fortune's Wheel. You know, I already built up all of the prizes and the grand prizes and everything. And uh, at this point... Uh, Jake had left and Gabe had come. So Gabe never got his first role on Fortune's Wheel. So Connor character went up 
and he, good deal. I'll take that. Went up, gave it a spin. He won, I think, some money, so he kind of broke even for everything. He was like, oh, I'm cool with that, whatever. And then Gabe's character spun. Uh, he's a human monk. He gave her a spin, and he won the big ticket prize. He won the apparatus of Qualish, right? And he's like, I don't know what that is. I don't care, blah, 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 blah. He's like this naive monk type of character. So Val Valak grabs him, and they, uh, you know, he's got showgirls on each arm, and they sit him at a table, you know, right next to the grand, the big ticket prize that was on display. I had described it earlier, you know, it's like a gold, gold leaf covered apparatus of Qualish. It looks, you know, it's just garish, just, just like it looks like a lot of freaking money, even if you don't know what it is. Um, but he, he wanted to know what it was, and then, you know, once they found out that he liked tea, this is the character that's fascinated by tea and wants to know everything about tea. They brought, like, a tea concierge, and they tried all these different kinds of tea, and, you know, different uh, patrons of the casino were coming up and shaking his hand like they were, they kept coming by, you know, to congratulate him and maybe rub some of his luck off on them. They're shaking his hand and patting his back and everything. And he's overwhelmed by all this attention. He's just a, you know, an, um, a modest monk. And now everybody wants to talk to him and touch him. And he's got beautiful women around him and they're throwing, you know, his, his fondest desires. And so now he's gone from, you know, a, like a vow of poverty to just, just overwhelming wealth and, and luck. And it's a little overwhelming for him. So he's, that's what he's doing. Everybody else is, you know, there's a uh, singers there and they talk to the singer after her, uh, after her set. They really liked her and they liked, I forget everything that I'd set up with that. But eventually Shemeshka comes, right? And I just kind of printed out the, the Shemeshka from, from the module uh, and described her. And um, she came down. She made eye contact with the party, didn't really say anything to them, did the rounds of the room, you know, met everybody, welcomed them to the thing, da 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 da, da. and then she went into the platinum room. She went through the portal that they, they knew there was a portal down this hallway where they kind of peeped it. She went back there, so they assumed that she went to the, to the platinum rooms. Uh, Valet came and got them and took them to uh, the private rooms. In the private rooms, they basically sat at like a boardroom table. Uh, they were in there for 15, 20 minutes, and then she eventually arrived in there. Um, she explained who she was. She explained, you know, as far as the proprietor, and that she was, uh, you know, um, what is she, an Arcanoloth, and that she had lost a Modron. She had a Monodrone that was basically a sentient calculator that was helping uh, with her accounting. And he had gotten lost from the last Modron march and had stayed in Sigil. And, um, you know, a, a Modron or a, a, yeah, a Modron accountant is, is a big boon. Um, so she had given him employment <clears throat> taken care of him, tried to get him adjusted, and he uh, at one point just basically hoofed it off. Um, but he has a lot of information about the casino, and if the party could bring him back to her, uh, she would be more than happy to help them um, to research and find out who they are. Uh, she kept saying that she didn't know exactly what was going on with the party, but she had sources and she was gathering information. So, if, you know, by the time they return, she would be able to help them with that information and help them, you know, rediscover who they are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the party, they wanted money. And she said, you know, I can, I can give you some money, some funds for, uh, to equip yourselves for this adventure. You know, I know you're, you're under equipped. Uh, to be going into, uh, you know, this sort of a mission, this sort of a quest. And, but your friend here won the big ticket prize. And the big ticket prize, uh, it, would, it would benefit me to, to not have to replace the big ticket prize. 
uh, I would be happy to just cash you out. Um, and then the monk was like, I, I don't understand money. I don't understand it. And the party's like, yeah, 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 we'll do that. And he's like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. And the party's like, ah, oh. so, um, they tried to haggle a little bit more. That didn't work out. They explained she, you know, Valak, she put Valak at their, at their, uh, disposal. Valak could help them gear up, et cetera, et cetera. They're welcome to stay here. Uh, she said, you know, she, she recommends that they, they leave no later than 24 hours from right now. The, they would be taking a portal to the Outlands. We'll supply portal keys. You know, Valak will, you know, take care of all the details. He's basically, you know, their contact for all of this. So the party was kind of, they wanted to know more about their situation. And she explained, you know, what I know I'm not going to tell until, you know, you've, you've done for me. And so they wanted, they were asking random questions. And she's like, that's not what I'm here for. And she kind of rebuffed them a couple of times and then eventually just left. Um, the other thing is Shemeshka, uh, for those of you that are old like me, you may remember uh, Zsa, Zsa Gabor. So I was playing uh, Shemeshka like Zsa, Zsa Gabor. Like she comes in and beautiful darlings. You know, it was it was way over the top, real fake with like whatever Hungarian accent, whatever kind of accent that is. Um, way over the top. And uh, as she got tired, it was uh, tired of them. It, it kind of slid away and you could tell like she is a fiend. You know, and that was... You know, it was uh, like the party wanted to, da, 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 and I was like, you know, man, this is a very powerful, very powerful being. Like you can feel the power of her. She has presence. She has wealth. Like she's, she is not. You're not arguing with uh, a a tout or a taxi driver. Like this is this is you're dealing with a powerful um, outsider creature that that has this type of establishment and like all of these people working for them like this person does not they're not intimidated by you at all they have no motivation to help you beyond what you can do for them and and after that they were the party kind of was like oh, okay all right we got a little we understand a little better so they eventually talked Gabe and Gabe's character by proxy into selling the apparatus of Qualish um, and then splitting the money, putting the money into basically a party pool and the party used that to buy items. So like they just got carte blanche with like a hundred grand uh, to blow in 24 hours before they leave. And, and they did, you know, they got cloaks of protection and they got, you know, they, they, they spent their money pretty well. Like they got, they got some gear, like they got some, like, it's, it's going to be nice. So, um, they did all of that. Uh, I let them rest again and level, of course, <laughs> they, all they do in this, in this campaign is level every, every session. So they leveled again. Uh, they went through to the outlands. So in the Outlands, I described it as far as the campaign explains it. Uh, the the walking, you know, the the footprints from the walking castle. You know, they okay. I guess we're gonna follow the walking castle. And they took off after that. Described everything the same, but because we had been in the casino this whole time, and they only, I guess the the ice dragon threw a fit and. Um, nobody got involved. Like they just let the Mesolods handle it. Like whenever, whenever the ice dragon went crazy, it, you know, everybody was like, oh, that's somebody else's problem over there. So, so that was kind of, so they didn't really have any combat. So I had planned for one combat before the end of the session. And what I did was I, I took a Melephant. um, um, Melephant, Melephant, um, demonic elephant and i had a, a elephant uh bust out of the tree line and it was being harried by blink dogs so i put like 12 blink dogs and we started with the elephant like 200 feet away so with it 200 feet away it was being attacked by blink dogs and it was attacking and basically killing the blink dogs but running straight at the party not realizing they were there 
And then the party, as soon as he got into range, they, they wanted to parlay with him. And it wanted them to submit themselves as slaves and servants or die. And the party wasn't into that, and they weren't into the blink dogs getting killed. Like, they all had a soft spot for dogs, and uh, especially good magic dogs. And the party engaged with it, and they fought, I think, a, a mouth that's like a CR-10. And the party engaged with it, and by the time... By the time that the Malephant was bringing down party members, all the Blink Dogs were gone, and the Malephant itself was not doing very well. So they, they did manage to down the Malephant, but um, I think one person went down, or they almost went down. It was, it was a good combat. We usually don't start combat that far apart, and... You know, the typical mistake uh, for the more novice players, they, they ran, they blew all their action points and ran right up on it, couldn't do anything, and then just got full attacks on them, you know, just wailed on. So hopefully they learned a little bit of a lesson to, to hold back or, you know, close half the distance and, you know, ready but they were like, you know, I dash, I dash, I, you know, I use my my uncanny whatever, you know, I'm gonna get up there as far as I can. They got right up in its face, and then it just full attacks on them. The Melephant, you know, it has noxious gas. It has a has a lot going on. But it was an exciting adventure, or exciting combat right for the end of the session. Again, this was our third session. Now, the fourth session, they get to go up into the walking castle. So, after the Melephant and they got, like, some loot, they finished tracking the castle, and that's where we left it, was they were looking up at the at the walking castle that was, was immobile, that was, um, like, uh, inanimate. So, that's where we left it. That's where we're going to pick up this next session. Uh, next session is next weekend. So, next weekend, in well, in June my birthday we had i had my saturday group in wayland and then i had my sunday group so i had like D, D weekend and it was great i couldn't do anything else on the weekend i basically just played D D and ate and slept and worked out but um it was great and uh my kids and wife are going to new jersey to the girl scout camp and all of this sort of stuff so they're going to be gone for a week week and a half and what do you know i scheduled them both up again so now two months back to back i got like D, &D weekend and the rest of the month is free so i'm um, once again wailing on saturday staying up late having a good time coming in getting up work out sunday monthly have them over at my house so i have high hopes it went really well this last time i've been doing really well with this campaign as far as timing out how long things are going to take and where we break uh, it's been really the very first session was the only one that i i kind of ran out of what i had planned to do like we kind of, i was just planning on spending more time in the mortuary and they were like nope we're out of here so I, I was kind of grasping. So like in that one, I'd spent I, a lot of time. I let it build up real slow to actually starting the adventure. And then at the end, I kind of ran out of stuff and was ad-libbing and, and, and looking at maps and trying to come up with stuff. So we stopped it a little bit early. But the, but the second and third sessions, we ended like at exactly the right time, like after a big combat and... Like just with a really a, a good sense of accomplishment, like it was just it was the, the these sessions have been timing out and wrapping up like the energy and everything really well. So I've been really happy with that. I'm happy with my players. I really like this set of players. They all seem into it. Um, that's about it. You know, uh, I don't want to go too much into the next session. I'm going to wrap that up. Uh, again, here probably in a couple of weeks, uh, whenever I finish. And beyond that, uh, things are going pretty well. I hope everything's going well with you. 
Again, YouTube, algorithm, like, subscribe, comment, engagement, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, you know, hit me up. I'm, I'm, I'm a know-it-all. <laughs> I'll, I'll respond to anything. Uh, so then until next time, I'll have that fourth session for you. And game on.